Many lessons, guys, to be learned in the dry places of life. You in a dry place right now? Are you listening for the still small voice of God? Or are you trying to figure yourself or your way out of this dry place? Hey, look up. Notice Moses back then, he was looking left and right, but he didn't look up. Many of us are looking left and right, but never looking up. And it's not until the walls start closing in and you can't move but so many ways. And so you're either going to look down in your stuff or you can get a chance to look up where your redemption comes from. Because when you look up, let me tell you what, he'll look down at you and pull you right out of that place. You know, I was talking to Pastor Matt earlier this summer and he was talking about this time that we're gotten here now, and, and he was putting together this series that he's doing, Welcome to the Table. And at that time, I was telling him, I was like, that's pretty interesting because I'm working through something about rejection in just in my heart and something that God had allowed me to go through. And, um, and, and it wasn't complete yet, but God was doing something there. And I shared that with him. And um, Told him like, hey, I may just be feeling led to share that there. And, and so it's interesting because I started to work through these things. And, and this whole thing happened really because, and there's a picture. Last year, um, I was with some men and the question was presented, draw your childhood table. And, and it's nothing like God to do something in you privately and then one day, he's going to make it public. <laughs> and, and so don't laugh at my artwork, guys, all right? Because I never, ever expected to put this on nobody's screen. I'm not an artist. I'm a pastor, okay? <laughs> and, um, and, and Pastor Matt asked me to bring this picture with me when I came. And so um, in the best of my ability, I drew my childhood table. Now, let me explain this chaos here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> and so this little weird looking thing, I don't know, it's off pink, but that's me. <laughs> and the table is here. This is my mom down here. And if you could see these little black lines, yellow lines. My mom was a 17, 17 when she had me. And I really believe in the depths of my heart that she loved me to the best of her ability. And I didn't understand this until the pandemic happened and God landed a 17-year-old young lady that was pregnant and had a child in my home. It didn't really come together as far as the support that this young lady received in my home. However, this is my mom, and there's dark love, and then there's bright love. I still say to this day, she loves me more than anybody in this world. She just has an interesting way of showing it at times. This is my mom doing the best at the age of 20, 19, when her and my dad separated to send me to different homes. So I lived with my mother's boyfriend at a time when it wasn't her boyfriend. I lived with my godmother. I lived with my aunts. I lived with my grandmother. I eventually lived with my dad and my stepmother. But that table, why am I away from it? I'm away from it because I always felt like a guest at the table. I felt like some of my cousins may have said, well, why is he here? Well, why does he get this? When he's here, he's a problem. While other cousins were excited to have me there. But I always felt, even when I lived with my dad and my stepbrothers were at the table, I was the guest. Because I felt like he don't belong here. I know this. I know that in every person 
whether you have healthy parents or not, it is the way that God has designed us that every child wants to be with their mother and father. I can't stand my mother. I can't stand. Look, you may be masking and pressing down those scars, but as a child, every child wants to be with their mother and father. They don't want step parents. They want their parents. But you know, I'll tell you this. God has a perfect design for family, and we know that from Genesis. But sin had an effect on God's plan. Broken homes all over the place, sinful choices, shatter tables. Here, understand this. It shatters tables around our community, our churches, and in our country, especially in this cancel culture. We can't come to the table and reason anymore because as soon as you out who you are for with politics, they'll cancel you. Some of you might have unfriended some people that you used to roll with before all of this stuff. But you see here, watch this. There's a table ultimately that we all been invited to. Y'all know the answer. But we're going to draw it out this morning in understanding this. Many here can relate to the effect of sinful choices we or others have made in life that have had a direct impact on us. I wonder today if you had to pay the total cost of your choices in real time instead of living through the guilt and shame from the choices we've made along the life journey, how many of us would sign up? Here, look, as you consider this, the main point I think today that God wants to convey to us is this, that he is a healer. He is a restorer. He mends broken things. In fact, the Bible tells us that he makes beauty out of ashes. He uses the things we have gone through, and he has a purpose in it all. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to turn to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. If you need a Bible, slip up your hand, and the ushers will bring one over to you. But this morning... Today, as we journey through a portion of Moses' life a bit, I'll share a part of my story concerning being deprived of a stable table, is what I want to call it. But here, look, understand, three points I'll give you if you're a note taker. I always encourage our church to roll with a pen, a Bible, and a tab, or a place, a tab, or something where you could write down notes. I believe God wants to speak to every single person in this room online. I believe God has something specifically for you. We're not just digging into the word. We're not just hearing a testimony through this story. And that's what it is, really. But God wants to speak to you. He knows your burdens. He knows your hurt. He knows why you're here. And I believe if you set intention to why you're here this morning, he'll speak to you. And so here, look, this morning as we jump into this, Father, we just thank you for your living word. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would meet us here, and that you would be glorified through the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. May they be acceptable unto you and to you alone, O God. Meet us here for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. We said it's Exodus chapter 2, and if you're taking note, three things I want to give us this morning. First of all, we want to look at purpose from birth. Purpose from birth in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6, purpose from birth. Secondly, we'll look at the pursuit of acceptance but rejected. The pursuit of acceptance, but rejected in verses 11 through 14. And then we'll come to a close in this last point, pulled into God's purpose, pulled into God's purpose in chapter 3, technically in verses 1 through 4, 1 through 4. 
We said the first thing we're looking at this morning is purpose from birth. And in Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, it picks up and it says, And a man of the house of the Levites went and took a wife of a daughter of Levi, so the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of burrows for him, daunted it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughters of Pharaoh came to him or came down to, the, to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw a child. And behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Here we see in verse 1, two Levites coming together. If you're familiar with the Bible, it's Amram and Jochebed. Here, as you look at these two, they come together and they conceive. That's normally what happens when you get married. You bear a child. And here comes this little one. We don't know his name originally. We'll see later on he's named by the Egyptians, Moses. Amram and Jochebed, they're, they're in a dilemma. They're in a dilemma. Why? Because the word was to kill all newborn baby boys. And here we have them here by faith. We know that Hebrews chapter 11 says they took them and hid him. They weren't afraid. I don't know where Amram was on this day. But I know that there was a decision to take little Mo, okay, <laughs> and put him in the Nile. What was it like for Jochebed to make that decision to let go of her newborn beautiful baby? I know some babies got a face only a mother love. <laughs> but this baby, it says distinctly that he was beautiful. Good looking. And now I got to put him in the now. You know, as you think about this newborn baby, here I understand this. Even though she had to release the child, God had a purpose for him. God had a purpose for this one. Hey, the best was yet to come from Moses' life. The best was yet to come in this situation for Jochebed and Amram as well. Here, look, as you consider this here, hey, the same was true when you think about in Judges chapter 13. Hey, the wife of Manoah, you see him here? Look, hey, this is Samson's parents. And this here, watch, hey, he, she was told that she would conceive a child. God had a bigger plan for Samson than what even she thought it would be. But God had to distinctly tell her, hey, you know what? You're going to have a child, and he will be a Nazarite from birth. She couldn't even conceive, and the promise went out. The same is true for Jeremiah. God had shaped him in his mother's womb from birth, had a purpose for him to be a prophet. How about Samuel with Hannah? God had a purpose for Israel, his plan, a bigger purpose than just, hey, you know what? Let me just give Hannah a child. But Hannah was desperately in prayer and asking God for a male child. And not only did he, she receive a male child, but she received a prophet. We just thought we was just having kids, having some fun after a nice night. Ah. God has a bigger plan for your life, 
Even in this point of time, I don't care how young or how old you are, there's a purpose for God in, in your life. If you're void of him today, he wants you in a living relationship first. Because let me tell you something that's just as true as God has a plan for you, the devil does too. Maybe many of us have seen and went through the effects of what the devil's plan was for our lives because we refused to yield to what God wanted to do in our lives. Here, we won't go to head, I won't get ahead of myself, but watch this. Verses 4 through 6, his sisters watching from afar while Pharaoh's daughters go down to the river to bathe. I want to call this a divine appointment. While bathing, she sees an ark among the reeds and opens the ark and she sees a child crying and had compassion on him, but could also identify that he was a Hebrew. It was in this house of the Egyptians that baby Moses would be named. We see that in verse 10. His name means drawn out. You know what? You may have been pu pushed out from a situation. For me, it was pushed out of family structure, a mother and a father in a home. I was pushed out because of bad choices. My dad was a heroin addict. My mother was young. They were married. And before I was two, they were separated. My mother was pushed over to my grandmother's house. I lived there for a while with her. And then she left and went with another man. My father would eventually get saved and try to kick down doors to, to, to have me live with him. But my mother blocked every door. Here, look, understand, as you see this here, hey, Moses is in this house. But God still had a plan for him. And here, as you think about this this morning, I want you to think about, hey, what were you pushed out of? Maybe for you it wasn't that deep. Maybe it was just sports. You wanted to play baseball. You wanted to play basketball. But every time you went on the court or every time you tried out, you got cut. And you felt rejected. But God still had a plan for you. You thought you were being pushed out, but I want to say this. Hey, instead of being pushed out and thinking that you were pushed out, maybe God was pulling you in to his divine purpose. And you see here, it's perspective change because this is what the reality is. Many times when we're pushed out, we feel what? Rejected. And that's where a lot of my rejection issues were birthed, where I should have been growing up in a stable place with the nurturing, hey, of safety, of security, right? I thought, well, let me just let you into something. The very things that I was going through as a child, God is now using for his glory today. And just like this one has compassion on little Mo. I can reason with a lot of young people, not with what they're saying, but what I went through. I know what they go through in the dark because of what God allowed me to go through. Here, look, I want to share this with you as you think about this with me. Moses was in the house of the Egyptians. He was taught by them to the, you know, his parents. I mean, his mother was weaning him actually to the age of three. I want to assume that she was probably pouring in everything about God she could possibly say to him, knowing that one day they would be separated from each other. And I want to challenge you parents. Don't just drag your kids to church and drop them off at Sunday care while you get adult educated in the word. That's just supposed to be the icing on the cake. It is your responsibility as a parent. It is not the church's responsibility as a parent, I mean as a church, to pour into your kid. Yes, that's what we do, but that should just be added. Oh, wow, when me and my mom or me and my dad were going through this text this week, and it just added to what God was already giving them during the week. 
<laughs> now, I ain't got who you think you are. Look, <laughs> if that's you, make a table for you and your child. You can pour into them. Oh, I messed that up. I'm a grandchild now. I'm a grandparent now. You know what? Time is not wasted. You sit with your grandchildren. And you give them everything you can about Jesus. Here, look, understand. This is what I was able to have <laughs> growing up. I had a grandmother that was a praying grandmother. And I didn't get to go and spend the night or weekends over her house much. But I tell you what, when I was over her house, the first thing you did before you brushed your teeth, you got on your knees and prayed. And after that, she it seemed like every time I was over there, she was telling me the David and Goliath story. Maybe that's all she knew, but she gave me what she had. Then after that, you made your bed. Then you went and brushed your teeth as she made breakfast. In the few times that I gotten to do that, it was a staple. I remember that. Here, you know, my other grandmother, she was a devout Catholic, and she taught me the rosary. And even when I lived with her, she sent me to Catholic school. I was expelled. Sorry. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I was an altar boy. I can remember distinctly at eight and nine, or eight, between the ages of eight and ten, I remember distinctly being on my grandmother's couch and crying out in frustration, why am I alive, God? Why am I alive? All I wanted was my mother and my father. And they were doing whatever they were doing. I was a terror by day, but I was broken by night. I'd go to school, cause all kinds of disruptions, craziness, fights, all of that. But in the nighttime, by myself, I wanted answers. that no one was there to tell me. Here, look, understand, but God still had a purpose and a plan. Here, as you think about this with me, we looked at the purpose from birth. And in this age, think about this for me, for yourself. Are you in pursuit of God's purpose or are you in pursuit of your own purpose? As you think about this this morning, look, hey, we looked at the pursuit of birth. Now let's look at the pursuit of acceptance, but rejected. Verses 11 through 14, we see there now, it says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out of his brethren's, I mean, went out to his brethren and looked, and there was they were, I'm sorry, let's start all over. That he went out to his brethren and looked at their burden. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And so he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, Behold, two Hebrew men were fighting, and he said to one of them, um, who, who did this wrong? Why do you strike your companion? And then he said, he told on himself, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Here we see something here. About 35 to 40 years have passed now, and Moses all has grown. But I wonder what happened in the window of space in that time of his life. When you think about him there, he never seemed to feel accepted in that home. Knowing that, hey, you know what, even as Pharaoh's daughter would say, he's a Hebrew. Even as he would go outside and say, man, these are my brothers. And defend the Hebrews. 
There was something that he felt disconnected. I can tell you there's a family that goes to our church and they adopted two Afri Af African-American children. And those young children give their adopted parents a run for their money. You would think like, hey, man, this, we, we blessed you. We put you in a good situation. Ease up. But those kids want their mom. They have rejection issues. Trauma is a word we'll use today, right? Everybody's in therapy and, and you know, need mental health days, and I'm not shooting that down at, at any cost. We have a little further understanding in what's going on in the heart and mind. But I understand this, no matter where you go for help, You'll never be completely fulfilled until you come into a relationship with Jesus and let him continue to build you from that place. He's the healer. He's the restorer. And we can try and go here and there, but it's at his table. I'll tell you, it's at his table where you find complete joy, peace, and even clarity on how to lean into even your brokenness, and be able to stand for his glory. While you're trying to suppress it, God is saying, hey, won't you stretch out your withered hand? I know you're trying to show everybody all your strengths, but hey, how about bringing out that withered hand so I could heal you? You remember the story? Don't try to hide that. You know what? Remember, Paul even said, hey, you know what? If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in what? My weaknesses, weaknesses help people, guys. Not all, oh, look what I'm doing. Hey, 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 that's what we think everybody wants to hear. I'm broken, but I'm firm. I'm standing on a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. I can tell you that. And without him, whoo, <laughs> and I mean that in every which way. But look. Understand, Moses should have been nurtured, and he was receiving nurturing. But look here. Even though he had all the accolades as a prince and all the benefits that come with being a prince in a palace, he was still looking for acceptance. And so he steps out this house, and what does he do? He put, the, oh, no, I ain't going to say it that way. He beat this man down to death. You know, in the streets, we would say, like, he beat the bricks off this guy. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> but he beat him down, however, and then tried to hide the mess. I'm doing this for you. Why the next day I come outside and you throwing this in my face? After all, I'm doing this for us. Let me tell you how much foolish things I did in the name of friends. How many foolish things I've done with people in the streets because I was looking for acceptance. Guns, drugs, all of that. I've been there. I'm tough, right? I could... <laughs> Looking for acceptance. Scared. Don't know what's going to happen. Keep that image. Tough. Now I'm in my community smiling at everybody. Everybody think I'm weird. <laughs> but look. I don't have to pretend. I'm free. While I see into all this facade. But when I was in this place, from whether it was family, whether it was friends, look here, even early on in a church, I got saved in a predominantly white church, white collar, wealthy people. I come from the streets, do rag, pants, baggy. I'm coming up in there like, what's up? <laughs> but not many people look like me. Oh, I got to play the part. Let me put on some slacks and, and get a different outfit. I'm just being honest with you guys. 
<laughs> I'm looking for acceptance. These guys, man, well versed in the Bible. I don't know nothing. I hate it reading. Oh, I got to learn. And I just wanted to pack my head with information. God broke me. He said, I'm not a, a, a subject to be studied. I'm a person to be known. And so in those early years of looking for that, even early years in pastoring, I try to go to Newark and sound like my pastor. I got saved in Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge. Lloyd Pulley, if you know him, he's very monotone. You hear me? Imagine, well, the next verse and, 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 and getting you know, into the science. and That wasn't my audience. God gave me my own voice. And today, I got an audience of one, Jesus. I want to please him. And you know what? Whether people receive it or reject it, if I could go home at night and bend my knees and say, God, thank you for the day that you used me today. Did I get to be a part of your stuff? So be it. So be it. Because I think that it's all grace that I'm riding on anyway. I ain't never imagined living this life for sure. But I want to tell you, this past February, I didn't know just a few months after drawing that picture I showed you guys that my grandmother would die. And I thought I was totally healed from my childhood table. However, God was preparing me to experience something to get out the residue. So what happened? Grandmother was 98 years old, and at the burial, I was invited by my cousin to the repast. Get to the venue, come in with my wife and kids. And my aunt says, hey, Ray, can I talk to you? I go to the side. And she's like, oh, you know. Now, this side of the family's small. And she's like, oh, you know, you are overlooked because, you know, you're normally not around. And I could feel as she's talking, and she's talking to me like I'm 10. Or maybe the 10-year-old kid is just, just raging up as I'm faced. I'm facing this real moment of rejection. And it's coming up, and I could feel it. And in my 20s, I would have probably did something real crazy because I would have reacted in anger, and that's what I was, an angry young man, not knowing how to deal with my emotion. I wasn't healthy then. But as I'm listening to this, I said, look, hey, I'm almost 50 years old. Don't talk to me like that. Like, I'm not, I, I deal with people. I could read through all the, the, the stuff. So she said, oh, you know, but, but, but you know, we, you, there's no, no space at this table, but we'll go in there and get another table for you in the open area. It wasn't even in the same room. It wasn't but for a minute my oldest daughter said, Dad, we don't have to stay here. I'm over here trying to figure it out. All right, I'll squeeze in on the table because I still wanted to be accepted at the table. Well, we don't have to do it. Okay, let's leave. Walking out, my uncle, who I actually talk to often, I'm sharing this with him. He was part of the planning. He's like, oh, yeah, there's a restaurant around the corner down the block. I said, oh. Bam! In the car, I ain't talking to nobody. I'm just driving. My mom's with me because my mother was like, if my son can't stay at the table, she was actually trying to protect me from even going. She knew what was up. <laughs> I was just accepting the invitation from my cousin. And so, get there, in the car, I'm driving. My cousin calls me. Where you at? I said, oh, I'm not there. I left. They did whatever. She went off. Crying, I'm so sorry, uh. 
And she removed herself from the table, said, if my cousin can't be at this table, neither will I. I was hurt. That was the truth. I was hurt. But I've learned along the years to turn my pain into fuel. And what Satan means for evil, God always turns for good. You may be in this room right now. You're like, oh, poor him. No, poor me. Where's your area of rejection that God wants to meet you at, wants to heal you from? We all face it. Well, who will you run to? I began to run to Jesus at this time, and he began to heal me and give me stability to stand in this space. And here, as you look at Moses' life, verses 13 and 14, it was at this point Moses fled to the wilderness, to the place called Midian. But he wasn't free. What do you mean? He was in Saudi Arabia. Midian means strife. But he had to deal now with isolation, identity issues, leaving his privileged home or lifestyle in Egypt where he was a prince, well-educated, commander-in-chief. He's away from his, what I would call, normal place. And when you see him here, watch this, he was basically pushed out by a situation. But again, God was pulling him into his purpose. And I want you to see this for your own life. Here, watch. He was pushed out by fear, but being pulled right into God's purpose. And we'll see this here now that we've covered a purpose from birth, a pursuit for acceptance, but rejected. And now let's look at progress with purpose. Oh, I'm sorry. Pulled into God's purpose. I'm sorry. Pulled into God's purpose. Go over with me to chapter 3, picking up in verse One, it says there, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he had led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, to the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And so he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire. Check it out. But the bush was what? Not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And so when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Moses is now in the wilderness. He picks up a Gentile bride, just like the Lord did with you and me that are walking with Jesus. Here, watch this. He's tending not even his own flock. It's his father-in-law's flock. And here, watch this. He brings them to the backside of the desert. Horeb. It means dry place or glowing heat. But did you catch this? It's the mountain of God. It's the mountain of God. It's the place where Mo is really going to encounter God. How many years apart from his parents, but his mother and father probably prayed for their son every day he was away from the table. And even though they didn't spend much time at the earthly table, they ultimately would spend time at the heavenly table. Here, look, as you see this with me, watch. Whether you're in Midian in the wilderness or you're in Egypt, which is a type of the world, God knows right where you are. And you know what? He will... Meet you right there. 
He will find you right there. And while we are pushing for acceptance, he is pulling to get our attention so we can align ourselves with his purpose. It's in this place, in the wilderness, in the dry place, where all seemed hopeless, when all seemed lost, where you've thought, what mistakes have I made? Or maybe Moses said, man, I was the man. Why would I give up all of this for just trying to get in somebody else's business? But no, watch this. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, man, I had it all. I had the career, I had the business, I had the car, I was secure, I had security in the bank, I was good. Gave it up all for God. I gave it all up and now I'm miserable. Here, look, understand. Moses, yes, was a chief, I mean, I'm sorry, a child of a slave, but became a son of a queen. Was born in a hut but lived in a palace, went from poverty to unlimited wealth. He's fit for the city, but now he's dwelling in the wilderness. He's intelligent, but now living in the desert. And he was a commander in chief, a warrior, but now he's keeping somebody else's flock. But again, God knew exactly where Mo was. And so he met him there. Many lessons, guys, to be learned in the dry places of life. You're in a dry place right now? Are you listening for the still small voice of God? Or are you trying to figure yourself or your way out of this dry place? And God's saying, closed, blocked, duh, hey, look up. Notice Moses back then, he was looking left and right, but he didn't look up. Many of us are looking left and right, but never looking up in the same respect, right? And it's not until the walls start closing in and you can't move but so many ways. And so you either going to look down in your stuff or you can get a chance to look up where your redemption comes from, your rescue. Because when you look up, let me tell you what, he'll look down at you and pull you right out of that place. Here, watch this as we begin to land the plane. In verse 2, the Lord appears to Moses in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. Moses looks at this bush and notices it's burning, but it's not consumed. I want to say this to you. Look, hey, this word consume means eat up or destroyed by fire. And I want to say this to you in your dry place, perhaps, or when you find that place, or if you ever get there again, you'll approach it differently. Because this time, you'll begin to see that dry place as a challenge for you to see the glory of God instead of, oh, I'm just stuck in depression or sadness or grief. Hey, you know what? Hey, I can look to God. That pain, that thing that hurts, look, hey, it won't consume you. It won't destroy you. It would actually build you. It will continue to burn away every impure thing about you and I. But hey, you know what? You will be able to stand in the midst of the heat for the glory of God. And so here, amen, praise God. And so here, look, verse 3, Moses chooses and see this. He decides to turn and see the great sight. You and me got the choice to turn and see the great things that God can do in the midst of us. In the midst of your challenging situation, the midst of the pain, the agony, the hurt. Hey, you know what? How can this get God some glory? Let's get some glory for God in this. So often we're, we're stuck in, oh, woe is me. We're going to murmur, murmur, murmur. You know, most of them are going to meet some of them later on. We ain't going to get there. But people just murmuring. 
Don't do that to the pastors here, all right? I just want to let y'all know. Don't, don't murmur and say, hey, I, I got some solutions for this problem right here. Do that. I wish some people would do that at our church. Like, it's not mur- that's what I'm telling y'all. Like, I'm just telling you what he would want to say to you guys, you know, that's all. <laughs> Look, at five years old, I turned and saw a great thing that God had done when I went to church, when my dad brought me to a church one weekend, I was staying with him, and God healed me. I, was, I had asthma, and the pastor just said, hey, if anybody wants to be healed of anything, come forward. I was five years old. I responded to the gospel at five. I lived like a terror, but that weekend, I, something happened. I was healed. I never had asthma again, and I saw the sight of God. He touched me and marked me there. I was 10, and my neighbor brought me to church with them. And when I went to church with them, they had an altar call. I went and responded and started going to church by myself from 10 to 14. From 14 to 22, I ran the streets. But it was at 22 years old that I had a lot of money and just wanted to bless a church. And I would go to church, to church, to church, looking for the church to be a blessing to, and I would see scams. And I'm saying, the people in the church falling for this foolishness? I'm from the streets. I don't know this stuff. And I can see right through it. But it was one day, sitting in a church that I was invited to at Old Bridge, the pastor said this. I was angry. I went, but I was angry because I was church hopping, looking to be a blessing. And my dad invited me to this church. And when he brought me there, I was mad thinking that the pa- he told the pastor all my business. But I was sitting there with some stuff in my mind saying, man, I'm going to go home. I'm going to get rid of the drugs, the guns, and I'm going to get my life right with God. And the pastor said, you may be sitting here thinking you can straighten up your life, but God wants you to come just as you are, and he'll do the cleaning up. I said, what? Like, <laughs> I responded to the gospel message then. And been walking with Jesus. But watch this. Moses here, as he hears the voice of God speaking to him, look, watch this. God's commissioning him to deliver the Israelites out of slavery. Moses, remember, was a stuttering fugitive. God's saying, no, you're going to be my voice to deliver some people out of bondage. Moses said here in the text in verse 4, you see it? He says, here I am. You skip down to verse 10. God starts to tell him what he's going to do. He said, man, you're going back to Pharaoh. Well, I done, I done killed one of their peoples. You're going to send me back there? There definitely got to be somebody else for this program. I thought you said, here I am. But watch this. The Lord says, and this is what I want to point out before we close. Moses got to a point in verse 11. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? This is what the Lord says. I will certainly be with you. This is what I want to ask you as we think about this. Where are you looking for purpose? True purpose can only be found with Jesus when Jesus is at the table. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. Is Jesus at your table? Because Jesus faced the ultimate rejection on behalf of humanity. He was mocked, despised, and finally crucified by those he came to save. He was rejected as a leader. But it's through Jesus' rejection that we find acceptance. Where are you looking for acceptance? From your parents? 
parents looking for acceptance from their children, we from our friends. Look, what I didn't embrace was despite all the rejection I experienced, there was always a table that I was welcome to and even invited to. But the truth of the matter, at that point in my life, that table didn't look appealing to me. Maybe today you're trying and aspiring to be at the wrong table. You want to be at Jeff Bezos' table. Maybe you want to be at Donald Trump's table. <laughs> Your favorite celebrity's table. Let's lighten it up a little bit. You want to be at Pastor Matt's table. And he's a generous guy and, and he loves the flock. I could see it. I'm watching it. He loves you guys. But you also have to protect your pastor that he doesn't burn himself out. You're just one person. But if you opened your eyes and looked around, he's trying to meet each one of you. And he wants to serve you guys. But how many people are going to come alongside and raise his arms up? And not only, hey, hey, what can you give me? I want you to be at the table. But I also want you to pour out to others and create a table that Jesus could be met at. Here, look, as you close, as we close out, I said that three times, right? <laughs> Do you find value in Jesus' table, at Jesus' table? The gospel is God's answer for rejection and in Christ Jesus every story of rejection has the opportunity to become a story of redemption through the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ but just as Moses eventually delivered God's people out of Egypt Jesus also will deliver God's people from bondage are you in bondage today look here as I pass this over to Pastor Matt I pray that you would respond in the right manner to what you have heard today and what God wants to do in your heart today. I thank you. It's been a blessing to meet many of you and pray to meet more of you. May God bless you guys.